Welcome to Master of the Game. We are talking about D&D Basics, and we've got the Player's Handbook today talking about races and sub-races. So let's get started. Make sure you head on over to rpgjuice.com where you can get caught up on the latest videos, the latest news, and blog posts from Juice himself. So chances are if you're watching this series, you're new or newer to Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, maybe you've played previous editions and you just want to understand 5th edition more, um, or maybe you've just never played a tabletop RPG, and that's okay. Uh, I want to encourage you, if you have never played a tabletop RPG, go check out the series. Uh, the Introduction to Tabletop RPG series. You'll find a, a card here uh, that you can click and uh, it'll take you to that playlist. Now, <clears throat> so in 5th edition, when you're creating a character, you're going to have a race and a sub-race for most of the races. Um, on page 12, there's kind of an overview of the different ability score adjustments based on the races. And this is a nice summary because if you're not sure what race you want to be, but you have an idea what class you want to be, you can see where the bonuses are going to come from that are going to benefit certain classes. So, for example, uh, say I want to be a barbarian. I'm going to want something that's going to buff my strength, uh, possibly my dexterity, uh, but also my constitution. So, looking this over, I see that there are four races or sub-races that get bumps to strength. The Mountain Dwarf gets plus two, the Half-Orc gets plus two, the Dragonborn gets plus two, and the Human gets plus one. Uh, looking down at Constitution, I see that a Dwarf gets a plus two, Stout Halfling gets a plus one, a Rock Gnome gets plus one, a Half-Orc gets plus one, and a Human gets plus one. So looking at this, I personally would narrow this down to a mountain dwarf or a half orc if I'm playing a barbarian. But maybe uh, I'm more interested in the feet that I could get at first level. Or maybe my, game, my group doesn't play with feats. A human is not a bad choice for almost any class. So a human would be good because I get a plus one in both of those attributes. Um, the half orc is good because I get a plus two to strength and a plus one to the constitution. And a mountain dwarf would be great because I get a plus two to both. Uh, and that's really, really really good. Um, so I, looking at this, I would actually say the Mountain Dwarf is the best barbarian. It's probably the best fighter, um, you know, from an attribute standpoint. A half-orc is really good uh, just from the attribute standpoint because of the bonuses they get. So again, that's a really good page if you're not, or not sure what race you want to be. Um, but you're looking at which attributes would benefit the class you want to be. And this goes for wizards too. So say if you're a wizard, uh, you know that a high elf gets a plus one, a tiefling gets a plus one, a gnome gets a plus two, and a human gets a plus one to intelligence. Based on that, I would say the gnome would be the better wizard. Um, a human could be good. The other things can be good as well. Um, but, you know, just this page covers a lot of good things here. So, with that, uh, let's get into what the different races are. Alright, so there's a lot of good races in the Player's Handbook. Uh, I personally have dice that actually are for every race. Not the sub-races, but what, every race. Um, now, when creating a character, you know, you're going to want to talk to your DM about what races they allow and don't allow. Uh, I know there are some people who don't like to allow gnomes, or they don't want... Uh, don't like to allow Dragonborn. Um, so again, it's going to be based on your group. In 5th edition, if you're using the book as written, uh, here are the different races. Dwarf, Elf, Halfling, Human, Dragonborn, Gnome, Half-Elf, Half-Orc, Tiefling. That's all the races that are in the core book, the Player's Handbook. Um, obviously, your Dwarf, Elves, uh, Halflings, and Humans are your most common uh, your least common are probably going to be your Dragonborn, Gnome, and Tieflings, um, Half-Elves, Half-Orcs, and, uh, yeah, 
half elves and half orcs are going to be a little more common than those. Um, now, dwarves, a lot of these are going to have sub races. Dwarves are going to have your mountain dwarfs and your hill dwarfs. Your elves are going to have uh, your your drow, for example. Drow is a big one that a lot of game masters don't use, but again, um, that is an optional thing according to your dungeon master. Um, if you're playing as written, you're probably going to play and allow drow. Um, so you've got that. Uh, you've got humans, obviously, don't have sub races. However, um, certain settings might have different uh, different races of humans. For example, you might have some a human race that's from a jungle. Uh, they might have certain abilities. You might have another that's from the mountains and, and things like that. So uh, it will depend on the setting. Right now, I don't believe there are any um, sub-human races uh, in any of the books. Uh, but who's to say that won't happen in the future? Um, I know other systems are, are trying to have differentiated humans uh, moving forward in their systems. And I think that's a good idea. And I, I, I kind of like that idea that... No two humans are alike, just like no dwar two dwarves or elves. I, I like variety. But this is 5th edition, so let's get back to it. Gnomes, you're going to have your your tinkering gnomes, which I think tinkering gnomes are cool. I like the idea of having a little gadget, maybe a little tiny dragon that breathes fire. Uh, I think that's really cool. In fact, we played a game that had a... Um, it, it's on my channel, the Adventures of Thakos. We had went into a dungeon thing and ended up with an NPC thing that came along with us called Clocky. And he was like a key master. He opened all doors. Really cool. Um, half elves, half orcs uh, do not have sub races. Um, you know, the idea is it's a half elf is a mix of a human and an elf. Half orc is a mix of a human and an orc. Um, very, very good stuff here. Now, uh, let's talk about dwarves real quick. Let me let me flip to the dwarf page. We'll just go through every race a little bit. And, uh, yeah. So on page 18 uh, and 19, there's a lot of lore. Uh, some ideas, you know, if you're making a dwarf, maybe on how to role play it. Some family history and things like that. Uh, there's some good dwarf names. I love using the names in here and mixing them to come up with some cool things. Um, so the traits, you're going to get a set amount of traits from each race, and then you get more from the sub-race. So again, constitution plus two from being a dwarf. Uh, size is going to be four. It's still medium, but he's going to be about four to five feet tall, 100, about 150 pounds. Speed's only 25 feet. Uh, dark vision 60 feet dwarven resilience gives you advantage against saving throws or on saving throws against poison um, and poison damage uh, dwarven combat training gives you some weapon proficiencies which is nice you get a tool proficiency um, stone cunning you get your language and then your sub race uh, sub race would be either hill dwarf or mountain dwarf um, now again this you can do whatever race and sub-race you want and play whatever class you want. Uh, however, the purpose of this channel is mastering the game, and we like to talk about optimizing. So, a hill dwarf, because you get a wisdom score of a plus one, and you have a constitution increase of plus two, something like a cleric is great for this. Another one that's a really good um, class to play as a hill dwarf could be a druid. Um, anything that's going to use your wisdom score is, is good for this. Uh, monks are good, make for good hill dwarfs. Um, so again, I, I think those are some interesting routes you can go uh, if you want to be a hill dwarf. Now a mountain dwarf gets a strength of a plus two and you get proficiency in armor that is light and medium. So you can play this in a lot of different ways as a mountain dwarf. Uh, you're going to have a, a strength and a constitution of plus two, which means typically you could be good uh, up front. Uh, frontline fighter um, you could be you could play this as a monk again um, this might even be good for this is really good for barbarians really good for fighters um, would probably be really decent for a paladin um, 
you know, the, the thing is, because of the armor, you know, all those things are pretty much negated with the armor because you're going to get it from those classes for the most part, except for the monk. and um, I, th I don't think the barbarian gets medium. They might get medium. Um, but you're going to use un unarmored defense, probably, if you're a barbarian. Uh, so anyways, I think this is good. You're, you're kind of bypassing the dwarven armor training, um, but you can make a really good fighter, really good barbarian with that, and a really good monk. Um, I like the idea of doing something a little non-conventional and doing something like a warlock um, that's wearing medium armor, maybe a wizard using medium armor. It's not optimal, but it's really fun flavor-wise. Now, elves, page 21. Elves, also on page 22, and part of page 23 gives you the lore and the names like we discussed. Elves are going to get a dex score of plus two. Uh, they are extremely old um, compared to all the other races. Usually don't start their adulthood until they're at least 100. Um, they're taller, usually over six feet tall, sometimes a little under. Speeds 30 feet, dark vision, keen senses. You have proficiency with the perception skill. Um, fey ancestry, you have advantage on saving throws against being charmed. And magic can't put you to sleep. That is huge. Uh that one is huge because when 5th edition first came out, I remember playing games where my players would put other party members to sleep on accident. <laughs> so that's huge. Uh, trance means they meditate for 4 hours rather than sleep for 8 hours, so they don't have to take as long of a long rest. They speak Elvish, obviously, and then they get a sub-race. A high elf, um, they get some magic, um, they get an ability score increase to, to intelligence, they get... Elf weapon training with a long sword, short sword, short bow, and long bow, which is good for a lot of reasons. Uh, you know one cantrip of your choice from the wizard spell list, and your intelligence is your spellcasting ability for it. Get an additional language. So a high elf is really good for playing a wizard. It, it really is. Um, you know, they're good for playing an eldritch knight. Um, which is a subclass of fighter, which we will discuss in a future video. Um, they're, they're good for a lot of things like that. The cool thing is, is if they're a wizard and they're, they got a longsword, that's awesome flavor-wise, you know? Think of a wizard that's wielding a longsword. That's cool. Um, you know, they're, they're good for playing um, arcane tricksters because arcane tricksters are spellcasting spell casting rogues. Um, but dex is important for a rogue. Uh, so again, those are all really good. Now, wood elf. Uh, wood elves get a wisdom score increased by one. Again, this is great for things like ranger, druid, cleric, um, things like that. Again, elf weapon training. Long sword, short sword, short bow, long bow. Fleet of foot, which means their walking speed is up to 35 feet. So that's good. And... Mask of the Wild, you can attempt to hide even when you are only lightly obscured, obscured by foliage, heavy rain, falling snow, mist, and other natural phenomena. This is great for rogues and assassins and dex-based fighters. Um, it's great for anyone who wants a high wisdom score. Druids, rangers, monks, all that stuff. Really good. So... Um, you know, again, I, I like that. And then there's the Drow. The Drow gets an, a Charisma score increased by one superior dark vision, so they can see up to 120 feet. They are, and this is something that's often overlooked, it's called Sunlight Sensitivity. Disadvantage on attack rolls and on perception checks that rely on sight when you, the target of, when you... The target of your attack or whatever you are trying to perceive is in direct sunlight. So if you are in sunlight, basically, not under the canopy of trees, but you are out there midday on a clear day, you should be having disadvantage on anything that has to do with your vision. Um, again, this is often overlooked. GMs, DMs, players forget this all the time. So again... Use this to your advantage, Game Masters. If you have players that insist on wanting to play a draw and you really don't want them to, you know, because maybe you're worried that they're OP or something, this is a great way to balance that out. So again, 
This is a, a very good weakness for you to prey on if you're a dungeon master. Uh, they get Drow Magic, you know, the Dancing Lights cantrip. When you reach third level, you can cast the Fairy Fire spell once with this trait and regain the ability to do so when you finish a long rest. When you reach the fifth level, you can cast the Darkness spell. Darkness spell. Once with this trait and regain the ability to do so when you finish a long rest. And then you get Drow Weapon Training. Uh, that is rapiers, short swords, and a hand crossbow. So that weapon training is a little bit different. Um, drow make for great warlocks. Uh, they make for decent paladins, depending on your oath. Um, that's Those are the two I like to, to see them as. Uh, I know some people like to play them as assassins. Um, the superior dark vision is huge, especially if you're a warlock. Um, you know, I think there's some, oh, actually magical darkness doesn't work that way. Um, but you can cast the darkness spell and, uh, there's a thing under that that kind of goes with it so you can see through it. Um, drow are cool. You know, there's a lot of cool things you can do with drow. There's a lot of good role-playing opportunities. They are kind of cliche. A lot of people play them a certain way. If you're into that, more power to you. All right, let's talk about the halfling. Starts on 26, 27, and though that's where all the lore is in the names. Again, love the names. I often look at the names to come up with my characters' names. So halflings obviously are small. Think of the uh, Lord of the Rings. You have the um, hobbits. Great example. Uh, obviously, they don't call them hobbits. I believe that's for copyright and trademark stuff but yes basically same type of thing so halflings uh, get a dex increase of plus two um, obviously they're small sized unlike other races that are medium uh, they're about three feet tall weigh 40 pounds now <laughs> I've played many games where people toss a halfling it's a very common thing in some goofier games just a heads up now Lucky is a huge trait that halflings get. When you roll a 1 on your attack rolls, ability checks, or saving throws, you can re-roll the die and must use the new roll. So basically it's like get out of jail free card anytime you roll a 1 on the d20, uh, but you have to use the second roll. Uh, brave, you have advantage on saving throws against being frightened. That's a big one um, because there's a lot of monster abilities that make you make saving throws to not be frightened. Dragons, for example, are a good one. Uh, halfling nimbleness. You can move through space of any creature that is of a size larger than yours. This is big, too. You know, if you're in a crowded hallway and you want to get through, uh, halflings can go through squares with other characters in them. Other, or other races can't. That's huge. Um, this is really huge when you're in gridlocked areas in a dungeon. It's a single five-foot wide hallway, for example. If you're using miniatures, you'll notice it more. But, um, yeah, choke points are not as effective against halflings. And as a dungeon master, you can use them as bad guys. Remember this. If you can use them as bad guys, and you have players that are very tactical, boom, here you go. You got this. Use it against them. I, you know, in fact, I don't think as a player I've ever fought against halflings. That would be awesome. So anyways, uh, and then you get a lightfoot halfling and a stout halfling. So lightfoot uh, gets a bonus to the charisma score, and they're naturally stealthy. You can attempt to hide even when you are obscured only by a creature that is at least one size larger than you. So if you have a lightfoot halfling and it's behind a um, another player character, for example, you can try to hide. And that's awesome. You can't do that otherwise. Um, that makes them good to be rogues for the sneak attack. Um, that makes them good to, you know, be a ranger. You know, get, hiding is a can be really, really helpful in 5th edition. Um, the charisma score makes them decent as paladins again and uh, sorcerers. Things like that. So the decks and the, the charisma is really helpful when it comes to those things. Um, the stout halfling. 
Constitution score increases by one, and you have advantage on saving throws against poison, and you have resistance against poison damage. So it's kind of like a lesser version of a dwarf, <laughs> the, the bonuses you get there. Um, that's kind of cool. Uh, I like that. I think you can do a lot of stuff with that. And, um, you know, with the constitution plus one, the dex plus two could make for a good dex based fighter could make for a good, um, um, could make for a good ranger rogue, things like that. Again, halflings are great for rogues. One of the best things a halfling can be as a rogue. That's just how it is. It's almost like they are tailored to be rogues. Or burglars, if you like The Hobbit. Then there's humans. Humans are pretty much good no matter what you are. Um, so there's two ways your game, your dungeon master might use humans. They might allow the human variant, which allows feats, and they might not. If they don't, uh, every ability score increases by one. Um, 30 walking speed. That's it. Like They're just pretty much normal. There's not a lot of perks that come with it other than the ability score in every attribute. Now, if they're using the variant, uh, you get two ability scores increasing by one, two different ones. So you can't put two into one score. They each have to go into two different attributes. Uh, and the skills, you gain proficiency in one skill of your choice, and you gain a feat. That variant is huge. It's way better than not using it for a player. Um, so yeah, anyways, uh, the Dragonborn. Dragonborn are sweet. They're uh, on page 32 and 33. That's where all the lore is and the names. And uh, Dragonborn are pretty powerful. I will say that. A lot of people I know um, don't allow Dragonborn in their games. I like the idea of using Dragonborn. Um, and here's, here's what's cool about it. So they get a strength score increase of 2. Charisma score increase of one. Right off the bat, uh, first thing I'm thinking of is a paladin. A dragonborn paladin would be sweet. Very strong, very powerful um, because of the charisma bump. Um, let's see. They're consider they're almost always over six feet tall and 250 pounds. Uh, the thing that makes them awesome is they get a breath weapon. And depending on their color, it's different damage type and it works differently. Um, they get, so just to give you an idea with that, so um, the when they do that, whoever they're trying to hit, whether it's in a line or a cone, uh, is going to make a DC saving throw of 8 plus the, char plus the con modifier and the proficiency bonus. So uh, your Dragonborn has an 18, that means they're a plus 4 for their constitution. Um, that's 12... And proficiency bonus, say their first level, you know, you're talking about 16. So then if the creature fails, they take 2d6 damage on a failed save. If they make the save, they're still taking half damage. That's huge. The damage increases at 6th level, 11th level, and 16th level. That's powerful. Very powerful. Um, and a short or long rest will bring it back. They get damage resistance to the same damage type that they are associated with. Um, they also get Draconic Ancestry. Uh, you have Draconic Ancest Ancestry. Choose one type of dragon from the Draconic Ancestry table. Your breath weapon and damage resistance are basically that type. All right. Gnomes. Gnomes start on page 35. They're on 36. That's where you get the lore and the names. Gnomes have an intelligence intelligence score of at least two um, that's bumped by two um, so again your intelligence based classes are big uh, 25 feet 25 feet of walking speed they are small just like your halfling they get dark vision unlike the halfling gnome cunning which gives them advantage on all intelligence wisdom and charisma saving throws against magic that's big. That's that's really big. Um, languages. Now, subrace. There's forest gnomes and there's rock gnomes. Um, yeah, that's it in this book. 
The Forest Gnome is a dex plus one, so again, it's intelligence plus two, and now dex plus one. Natural Illusionist, you know the Minor Illusion cantrip. Intelligence is your spellcasting ability for it. Speak with small beasts. Through sounds and gestures, you can communicate simple ideas with smaller, smaller beasts. Forest gnomes love animals and often keep squirrels, badgers, rabbits, moles, woodpeckers, and other creatures as beloved pets. So forest gnomes would be like, again, your rangers and your druids. I know a lot of people who just try to play all gnomes as goofy and very, uh, I don't know. There's a lot of people who don't like gnomes because of how people tend to play them as these eccentric, goofy, not serious characters. Always making jokes, always playing pranks, tricksters. And, you know, that's fine. You can. Um, a lot of people, including myself, would probably say that's not as much fun as playing them in a more interesting way. Um, speaking with small beasts is really cool. Um, you could think of that as being played with, like, a wizard. Uh, wizards get familiars. I can't remember what level. At least they used to. Maybe they don't in 5th edition. We'll discover that in the next video about classes. But, um, yeah, small beasts, um, you know, and just think of, like, rangers and things like that. Getting an anim animal companion is kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, I would probably play forest gnomes as, you know, your typical druids, probably. I think druids are would make for perfect for a forest gnome. Um, or I'm sorry, yeah, yeah, I probably would, even though wisdom isn't their high point. That's probably what I would do. I think that's more interesting. But, um, wizard makes perfect sense, you know, when it comes to the attributes. All right, your rock gnome gets a con score of plus one that already goes with your intelligence. Artificer's lore, whenever you make an intelligence history check related to magic items, alchemical objects, or technological devices... You can add twice your proficiency bonus instead of any proficiency bonus you normally apply. So that's huge. Very, very big. There is an Artificer class in at least the Unearthed Arcana. Uh, I don't remember if they've put the Artificer in one of the newer releases. Um, I'll have to double check that. But uh, if you know, leave a comment below and, and correct me on that. But um, Artificers are huge it's a wizard subclass basically um and maybe it's its own class now at this point i don't remember uh, but then the tinker you have proficiency in artisans tools tinker's tools using those tools you can spend one hour and 10 gold worth of materials to construct a tiny clockwork device with an armor class of five and one hit point the device ceases to function after 24 hours unless you spend one hour repairing it to keep the device functioning, or when you use your action to dismantle it at that time, you can reclaim the materials you used to create it. You can have up to three such devices active at a time. Uh, so here's, when you create a device, choose one of the following options. A clockwork toy. This toy is a clockwork animal, monster, blah, blah, blah. Basically, I'm reading all this stuff to you. I don't want to. So you can get a clockwork toy, a fire starter, which, again, that's what I was talking about, making like a little dragon, uh, or a music box. Music box is cool, too. All right, then there's half-elves. Half-elves get charisma score of two and two other ability scores of plus one. That's huge. Um, they also get dark vision. They get fey ancestry, which means they get the advantage to saving throws on being charmed, and magic can't put them to sleep. Um, skill versatility they get two skills of their choice so those are pretty big deals um this the charisma score being plus two makes them great sorcerers again makes them great paladins um makes them really good bards that's the other thing uh, i haven't talked a lot about bards in this video but they would make for great bards as well then we're on to half orcs on page 40 uh, and 41. And half orcs get strength plus two, con plus one. They are. Uh, they have dark vision. They get menacing. They gain proficiency in the intimidation skill. Um, relentless endurance. When you are reduced to zero hit points but not killed outright, you can drop to one hit point instead. Can't use this feature again until you finish a long rest. That's a big one, especially for a frontline character. The idea that maybe you are down to like three hit points and a dragon 
does some massive damage to you and you're a high enough level, it doesn't kill you. In fact, it brings you down to zero, but then automatically you're at one hit point. Now this only works once, but that's huge. That gives you a whole, whole extra turn to do something. I love it. I think that's really useful. Um, a lot of us, when the game first came out, talked about how OP that might be. <laughs> and it hasn't felt OP, actually. It actually feels pretty pretty good. It's a really good ability, but um, yeah, it's not a problem. Savage Attacks. When you score a critical hit with a melee weapon attack, you can roll one of the weapon's damage dice one additional time and add it to the extra damage of the critical hit. This makes weapons that are... It makes the Great Axe really good, the 1d12. Uh, if you take a, make a champion fighter and you pair that with Savage Attacks, so um, champion fighter, for example, gives you improved critical. Uh, you get it at one of the lower levels and then get it again later uh, eventually it's like a 17 through 20 as a critical hit and being able to roll the 1d12 twice plus it's double damage so it's 4d or actually it'd be 3d12 um, plus your modifiers because again it's only one additional time and add it to the extra damage so yeah that's huge that's that's awesome and half orcs make for excellent barbarians um, I think they're great as barbarians. All right, then there's the tiefling. Uh, tiefling's on page 42. You get an intelligence score increase of one. Charisma score increases by two. Uh, dark vision is, is 60 feet. Hellish resistance, you have resistance to fire damage. Uh, Infernal legacy, you know a few spells of different levels and things like that or at different levels, plus you get Thaumaturgy Cantrip. So those are a big deal. Um, the Intelligence score increase of 1 and Charisma by 2. Um, there's not a lot of things that benefit from both of those um, directly, but this makes it so you automatically start leaning towards, I would say, Charisma-based classes, things, again, like the Bard and the Paladin. Those are where I would lean because of the Charisma, but... Uh, intelligence you could go wizard or uh, even eldritch knight um, would be kind of cool um, just because you get that plus one to intelligence um, so yeah you know tieflings are cool I, I actually really like the idea of, of using some tieflings and you know the the history of them is um, really kind of fascinating so the fact that you could role play them as not being well received is kind of cool. You can do a lot of things in game as it relates to role playing. So obviously this is one of my longer videos. My classes video is probably going to be equally as long. Um, so again, I hope you'll enjoy that as well. If you have any questions about any of the races, anything you don't agree or you want to add your two cents on about the races, leave that in the comments below. I'd love to hear about it. If this is your first time here, be sure to smash that subscribe button, hammer that like button. I would greatly appreciate it. And leave a comment below. Just let me know maybe what brought you here. And uh, I would love to interact with you in the comments below. So again, this is Master the Game. Uh, I am Juice. Game on.